25, the book of Exodus, chapter number 25, is where we'll be. Study on the tabernacle. And I have on here that this is part 13, but I think this is message, or part 13. I think we've probably had some two or three parters within a couple of different titles. So this is probably about our 17th, 18th, possibly even 20th message out of the uh, Tabernacle series. And uh, we'll be looking this afternoon at another piece of furniture within the Tabernacle. And uh, we've looked at we've looked at a couple already. Uh, we we done a an overview of the camp. Then we done an overview of the tabernacle itself, each section of the tabernacle. And then we started a couple of weeks ago. We started talking about the furniture of the tabernacle and learning more about what it means to us today. And uh, so today we'll we'll get into another piece of furniture within the tabernacle. So all who can and will let's stand together, and uh, we'll look here in verse number thirty one of Exodus 25, and we'll read down through verse number 40, and we'll let you have a seat again, and we'll get into the thought here for this afternoon, all right? Exodus 25, verse 31, the Bible says, And thou shalt make a candlestick of pure gold. A beaten work shall the candlestick be made. His shaft and his branches, his bowls, his knops, and his flowers shall be of the same. And six branches shall come out of the sides of it, three branches of the candlestick out of the one side, and three branches of the candlestick out of the other side. Three bowls made like unto almonds, with a knop and a flower in each branch, and three bowls made like almonds in the other branch, with a knop and a flower. So in the six branches that come out of the candlestick, and in the candlestick shall be four bowls made like unto almonds with their knops and their flowers. And there shall be a knop under two branches of the same, and a knop under two branches of the same, and a knop under two branches of the same, according to the six branches that proceed out of the candlestick. See, that's why it's important to bring your Bible with you. Because y'all would have thought that my, my um, record got stuck <laughs> right there, right? <laughs> I heard I saw 11, I thought, it does sound like my record got stuck. <laughs> but anyway, that's why you bring your Bible and read it with me because I can see people not reading their Bible, brother, might be like, what's wrong with him? Is he okay? Is pastor having a... What's wrong with him? So anyway, so that's a knob under two branches of the same. I mean, he wanted to make sure to drive that baby home that there's a knob under two branches of the same, okay? And uh, verse uh, 36, their knobs and their branches shall be of the same, and it shall be one beaten work of pure gold. And thou shalt make the seven lamps thereof, and they shall light the lamps thereof, and they may give light over against it. And the tongs thereof and the snuff dishes thereof shall be of pure gold. Of a talent of pure gold shall he make it with all these vessels. And look that thou make them after their pattern, which was showed thee in the mount. You can be seated. Thank you so much for standing as we are on the reading of God's word. This afternoon, this will be the third piece of furniture in which we've began studying. And uh, as we look there, looking at the tabernacle, this is the first that is not in plain sight of the people. This will be the first piece of furniture. We, we've looked at two others. Remember, we looked at the altar outside, and then we also looked at the laver. Out, laver. The, the labor that's outside, right? And uh, so we've looked at those. Those could be seen by folks as they brought in their sacrifices, right? So they could see those. This right here will be the first piece of furniture that we look at that's not open to the public to see. And uh, we, if we looked at the different sections of the tabernacle, and one of those being the holy place. This was as you walk inside of the holy place. If you still have your diagrams that I gave out several, several weeks ago, uh, that you walk in. And you see there's three pieces of furniture within uh, this, this uh, area and within this holy place. During that study, we talked about the different pieces of furniture that were there within the tabernacle, within that holy place. But we didn't give it a whole lot of detail. What we talked about was mainly the purpose of each one of those things. That whenever you walk in, each one of the different areas, we talked about their purpose, the furniture, and just didn't study a whole lot individually. Today, I want to continue our look at the furniture, and we're going to look at the golden candlestick. Now, we know from our previous study that this was a source of light there within the holy place, right? It was a source of light there that uh, you couldn't see without having light 
in there, right? Because it had the tapestry over top of the tent. There was no way to see once you got inside there. And so this was a source of light as will come into play here in just a few moments. But as we look here this afternoon, I want us to understand a few things. We're going to look at the candlestick itself. We're going to look at the way it was constructed. We're going to look at it historically as well as what we know from the Bible. The Bible doesn't give us everything that we want to know about the size of this candlestick and things of that nature. There's more historically you look at, and I'll make sure that we understand uh, between historically and biblically speaking, okay, um, as we get to it. Uh, so as we look here at the golden candlestick this, this afternoon, we'll look at it not only that way, but then we'll look at how it applies to us and the application to us and the application to it there in that day. Okay, so let's pray. Let's ask God to meet with us, open our eyes, and open our hearts to his word that we might can learn and be drawn closer to him today. Brother Matt, how about you pray for us, please? Father, we're thankful again, Lord, for another opportunity uh, to open your word, dear Father, and what we just ask, uh, Father, that you guys have to lift in heart and mind, Lord, and present this message to the Lord. Father, we pray that you be glorified in it all. Amen. Now, as we look here uh, this afternoon, and I'm going to say morning a lot or evening just because these services are always hard for me to get my bearings about me. And so if I say it, just do, yeah, that's right. Amen. All right. So as we look here at the different uh, facts concerning this candlestick, there's no size. There's no dimension given in Scripture concerning the candlestick. Both this and the laver were the only two pieces that I know of. That have the um, diff that has no dimensions given, if you will. Um, so now, historically speaking, historically speaking, it is said to have stood five feet tall, so probably about that tall. Said to be about five foot tall and about three and a half foot wide. So it's a pretty pretty good. Take a yard stick, a little better than a yard stick wide. So it's a pretty good size candlestick in there. And the Bible tells us that the candlestick uh, and from the candlestick were six branches. So you had the main branch going up. And then off of each side, you had three going out. Kind of like the one in the picture up here that we blurred out. But it's kind of, kind of that way right there. Just the dimensions are probably off on that from what, you know, historically speaking. Exodus 25, 32 tells us that the six branches shall come off the sides of it, three branches of the candlestick out of the one side and three branches of the candlestick out of the other side. So three off of one side, three off the other. And that one going up the middle, mathematicians, would give us how many lights? Man, y'all on the ball. We're going to feed y'all every week. That's good. Y'all got your math going. Somebody had their phone out, didn't he? Mr. Suzanne, Peter, he had his shoes off, didn't he? I saw it. I thought so. I thought that's what happened right there. But anyway, this stand, uh, this, this stand would be, have been built from one piece of gold. From one piece. So if it truly was six foot tall, three and a half foot wide, it would have had to been hammered out of a pretty good size piece of gold, right? We understand that because verse 31 of Exodus 25 tells us, And thou shalt make a candlestick of pure gold, of beaten works shall the candlestick be made. His shaft and his branches, his bowls, his knobs, and his flowers shall be of the same, right? They should all be the same. The goldsmiths would have been given and taken one talent of gold, and that being about 75 pounds. Could you imagine having a 75-pound piece of gold? Wouldn't that be a blessing? <laughs> hey, man, y'all know what that'd be worth in today's market? Over $2 million. Over $2 million? Mil, 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 mil. No, $2 million. Million dollars. Still a lot of money. In today's money, and, you know, I'd say it's a pretty expensive light. Anybody got any lights like that in the house? No? Come, come on, Browns. I know better. I know better. I seen something of me. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Bring it. Yeah, you should have brought one. Yeah, it's hammered out of pure gold. It's about 75 pounds. They got one. Worth about $2 million. They got it. And uh, so anyway, no, it, was, it would have been hammered out. So the goldsmiths would have taken one complete talent, one talent, and then hammered it out. And we know that from Exodus 25, verse 39. It says, of a talent of pure gold shall he make it with all these vessels. So, like I said, 75 pounds is a little over $2 million in today's economy. And um, this light would have been kept by the priests. And um, they would have used the oil to keep the lights burning. They didn't use wax. Now, by using the terminology candlestick, a lot of people think wax, right? If you have a candle, it's made of wax. So, 
our minds automatically go to, oh, it must have been wax, must have been wax candles, things. And it wasn't. It was actually used olive oil, as we'll look here in just a moment, was left. And it was, it was very expensive and nice olive oil. But that's how they kept the lights burning there in the, in the bowls of the candlestick. Leviticus 24, verse number 2 tells us, Command the children of Israel that they bring unto thee pure oil olive beaten for the light. To cause the lamp to burn continually. Now, this oil would have been a very high quality. Very high quality. If you're, if you're going to have a lamp worth $2 million, you're not just burning canola oil. All right? I mean, that's just, you ain't got just that cheap vegetable oil in there. All right? You're going to burn the good stuff. Right? This is going to be some expensive things, uh, some expensive oil that you're going to put in there. These lights would have been trimmed and kept burning, as was said there, burned continually. And uh, look with me there in Exodus, right? Look over in verse number 30, or chapter number 30, I apologize. Chapter number 30 in Exodus, and look in verse number 7. And I'll prove that point to you scripturally as to what the lights and how they were trimmed. And Aaron shall burn their own. Sweet incense every morning when he dresseth the lamps. Now that's talking about the altar of incense. But he said he goes in there to, and when he dresseth the lamps, he shall burn incense upon it. And when Aaron lighteth the lamps, the seven lamps that are on the candlestick, at even he shall burn incense upon it, a perpetual incense before the Lord throughout the your generations. Now it looks to me, scripturally speaking, that priests would go into the holy place to burn incense on the altar of incense, which was up against the veil that led to the holy of holies, right? He would go in there in the morning and in the evening. He would go to do that, and while he was there, he would take care of the lamps. When you first walk in, they would have been on the south side of the uh, holy place because you walk in from the east, right? You walk in from the east. South would be here, west would be across, north would be to your right. All right, so sitting on that southerly wall would have been this candlestick. So he'd go in there twice a day to take care of those when he was going to uh, burn incense there on the altar. So as he went in there, both morning and evening, they would come to the holy place to care for it. The lamp within the tabernacle stood for guidance. The light there within the, the, within the holy place stood for guidance, this lamp. This lamp is guiding as you step into a dark room. And when, what's symbolic of God's guidance of the children of Israel as he led them a cloud by day and a fire by night, right? They're symbolic of that. As you walk in there, you think about it. You walk in there, what do you see when you walk in? It's a dark room. We're going to look at four different ways that we can look at this, um, this candlestick today. Number one, we'll look at it symbolically, which we've already been looking at. Number two, we're going to look at it functionally. So symbolic, symbolically, functionally, and then we'll look at it um, spiritually, and then we'll finish up looking at it personally. All right, so that's going to be our four points today. Go ahead and give them out to you, and that way you've got them. But the lamp there stood for guidance. So number one is symbolically, as we've been looking at, it's symbolic of God's guidance to us. Now, functionally, we see that this light was necessary for this place. It would function as the main light in the holy place since light could not penetrate the top. Now, you can say, but pastor, there was light there burning on the altar of incense. Yep, but those were mainly coals. All right, there was just a hot coal over there burning. Y'all know coal don't give off a whole lot of light, right? You, you guys heat with coal. You don't have a big flame in there. If you do, it's just a little bitty blue flame that licks up through there. And, you know, it's not giving off a whole lot of light. So whenever you burn this oil, it's up there five foot high, and it's letting off a whole lot of light. So functionally, this was giving off a light. And the light couldn't, from outside couldn't penetrate the layer of the tent. Imagine that you enter into a dark room from outside where it's bright and sunshiny like we have today. It's misleading though because it's like 10 degrees outside, but it looks like it ought to be about 70. You know, beautiful, beautiful day God's given us. But you walk into a place, bright sunshiny like it is right now, and you walk into a room that's dark with the exception of a little bit of fire over here on the, on the westerly wall. And then you got this great big candle stick over here on your southerly wall. And think about when you walk in there. Where's your eye automatically going to be drawn to? 
It's going to go right to the light, right? It's going to go right to that. Because not only is it the lamp flickering, y'all know the way it flickers, but think about the way that that light that's flickering is dancing off all the other gold pieces within there. Could you imagine the beauty when you walk in and what you're seeing and the visual that you're taking in? So functionally, your, your eyes would have been drawn immediately to those flames and the sparkle as they resonate off of the other gold pieces within the room. Given the amount of darkness that would, that wouldn't be, that would be around, the light that would be given off would be just, it would be amazing how much light that would give off. It made me think of how the Lord is our light in a dark world. And how, Brother Peter, that even in the darkness of this world, I should still be able to shine. Mm -hmm. Right? Have you ever walked into a dark room with a candle? Brother Mike, before y'all had electricity, <laughs> it was there, it set up about that high for me. I had, I had to, I'm sorry. All of <laughs> That's right. So, you think about that. Have you ever walked in, obviously we've all had power outages, right? Mm -hmm. And you had to light, whether it be a, you know, a big, whatever those things are called, and your candle or whatever it was, and you're walking through the house. Where does the darkness go whenever the light goes by? Yeah. The darkness pushes away, right? No matter, that could be a dark corner in my room mm -hmm. until I take my candle over to it. Then the darkness is, flees from it, right? Mm -hmm. It flees from it. So as Christ in this dark world, through me, I should be letting off that light. You said, but it's so dark, preacher. This world's so dark. Yeah, I get it. But no amount of darkness can put out a light. Light can do away with darkness. That's just, that's just sensual to think about that. You can do it. Light can walk in. It makes sense. Light can walk into a dark room and make it no longer. This room was dark when we got here today. Or when the Browns got here today. They beat me here. When they got here, this room was dark. It wasn't pitch dark, but it was dark. They turned on the light. Light came on, filled the whole area with light. Right? But it doesn't matter how dark something gets. It'll never put out a light. And that needs to be our mentality living in this world. Now, functionally, this light gave off light within a dark place. No amount of darkness can ever overcome the light. A, a room never gets so dark that it can put out light. Darkness won't come in here and shut off these lights. It just won't happen. It won't overwhelm them to a point that it happens. Functionally, a light provides light. Now, let's look spiritually. All right, this will be the biggest point that we have looking spiritually. Go with me to John chapter 8 and verse number 12. John 8, 12. The Bible says in verse number 12 of John chapter number 8. Brother Matt, that's, that's New Testament. <clears throat> I know. I'm just messing with you. All right, John chapter number 8, verse number 12. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. In this verse, we see that Jesus is literally telling us that he is the light of the world. So, if we look at this spiritually, as we'll look now, we see that there are several truths combined within this one statement. We know that by him being the light of this earth, by him being the light, he was the very presence of God here on this earth, right? Because in the beginning, who was the light? In the beginning, God was. God's the light. So by him being the light here on the earth, Brother Mike, what is he? The very presence of God here on earth. The Bible teaches us that Jesus is not merely someone who is like God, but he's someone, not someone who's even very close walking with God. But rather, Jesus is the most God, most high God himself. You know that from Titus 2.13 says that Christians, we should and we are to be looking for that blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. Upon seeing the resurrected Christ, what did Thomas say? Thomas cried out in John 20.28 20, and said, my Lord and my God. Likewise, the book of Hebrews gives us uh, God the Father's direct testimony about Christ. 
In John 1.18, or, or there in that, he says, But of the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. In the Gospel of John, calls Jesus the only begotten God in John 1.18. We also know that Jesus has all the attributes of God, right? So spiritually speaking, this light, Christ, has all the attributes of God. He knows everything. Not, not like a teenager. He really does know everything, right? He's omniscient. He knows everything. Look with me in Luke 11. Luke eleven seventeen. 17. This is scary scripture right here, by the way. It's a blessing, but it's a scary scripture. Look at verse 17 of Luke 11. Luke eleven seventeen 17 says, But he, knowing their thoughts, that's enough to scare me to death right there. Yeah. Miss Nicole was teaching on purity this morning to the young ladies. I had a couple of young ladies and treat, teaching on being pure. Not necessarily, well, yeah, but it was about their mind and their heart, their body, everything. So it's just pure, being pure across the board. And you start thinking about that, are, is, is, are my thoughts pure? Are my thoughts pure? We can say, oh yeah, Pastor, my thoughts are pure. Are they always pure? And um, we're not, we're not going to get into that, but just something to think about. Because he talks about he knows your thoughts. He said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And a house divided against a house falleth. Now, he knew their thoughts. That's what he said. He said, I know your thoughts. Come, in John 4, 29, come see a man which told me all things that I ever did. Is not this the Christ? That's what that woman at the well said. She said that a Samaritan woman, when she met Christ, she said, come, you've got to meet this guy. He's told me everything. So we know that he is omniscient. He's all-knowing. He has the same attribute as God by Scripture is given to him. He's everywhere. He's omnipresent. Everywhere you want to be, there he is. Everywhere that you are, he is. Everywhere that you're not, he is. Amen. Matthew 18, 20. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. We love that scripture, don't we? Praise the Lord. It's good to be able to get on the phone with a Christian brother or sister, be able to go out and have a cup of coffee with a Christian brother or sister, and understand that where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. How many times have we quoted this verse? How many times have we said this verse to ourselves? It's amazing, though, that we forget the fact that he knows all and sees all, that he's everywhere, and yet so many Christians live a life outside of church completely contrary to the way we act at church. People have an image that they portray to others, yet in them, Brother Peter, they're just completely cold to the things of God. If the light of Christ is real in our lives, then our lives will reflect it constantly. Constantly reflect His teachings should be with us if we truly understand his closeness to us. We'll cover this here in just a few moments, but I just feel impressed to say it now. Sometimes we can be the reason people won't come to church. Truth be known, we can be the reason someone won't come to church. I don't want to be that. I don't want to be the reason somebody... Now... If they won't come because they think I live too much for God, I'm okay with that. I, I can get down with that one. But if they won't come because of the way I act, maybe the things I put on social media, maybe the things I like on social media. Can I hit that just real quick while we're there? I understand this. If you like a picture that's ungodly, People are going to see that. I see people liking pictures of folk drinking alcohol, folk playing ungodly music, folk hanging out at a bar. Oh, you look so pretty. Like. Let me say something. 
The world's taking notice of that. They take notice of that. And you know what that gives them? Something to fall back on and say, so-and-so ain't got it together like they say they do. I'm no better. Right? Be real careful. Just be real careful. Social media is a great thing. We use it. We're on it right now. Hello, Facebook. But social media can also be a very bad thing. Because everybody can see what you like. Everybody can see what you don't like. A lot of times they get a look inside of our homes that we don't mean for them to, but it accidentally happens. Right? So be real careful with that. Be real careful. Not only is he omniscient, not only is he omnipresent, but he's also all-powerful, which is omnipotent. Verse, uh, go with me to Matthew. Matthew chapter 8. Go ahead and go with Matthew chapter 8. Jesus tells us in Matthew 28, 20, he says, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Another scripture right there proves that he is omnipresent. He's always with us constantly into the end of the world. Matthew 8, verse number 26. We're going to look at him being all-powerful. Still talking about that light. Spiritually talking about that lampstick. Spiritually talking about the light being of Christ. Matthew 8, 26. And he saith unto them, Why are you fearful? O ye of little faith. Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. But the men marveled, saying, What manner of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? Many places in Scripture we find the elements obeying his word. Remember, Peter, I've been on the water several times, not near as many times as you have. Maybe you can help me with this because I've been on the water when it's rolling pretty good and my old gut starts saying, yeah, lunch is coming up, big boy. Right? I start filming and I try to pray and say, God, rebuke these winds, <laughs> rebuke these waves. It ain't never worked for me. <laughs> Has it you? Has it you? No, it ain't never worked for you. You know, you get to band in a lot and you're doing this mess right here and next thing you know, you're like, where's the horizon? <laughs> right? You know, got to get, get your gut back. I've tried. I tried to rebuke, wind, get down in Jesus. It don't work. I tried. I'm a captain looked back at me and thought he done lost his mind. Yeah. But I, I tried, but it doesn't happen. Why? Because I'm not all powerful. He's all several times in scripture we find the elements obeying his voice. So where did that power come from? You still in Matthew? Roll over to chapter 28. Roll over to chapter 28. And I'll show you where that power came from. We all know where the power came from, but let's look scripturally of what the Bible tells us here in Matthew chapter 28 and verse number 18. That power came from verse number 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. It is given by the Father. It's given by the Father. That's where all power comes from. You know why I don't have all power, Miss Rosemary? Because I know me. I'd be walking around. I'd stand down there on the wharf. It'd be nasty. I'd be like, y'all want to see something? Watch this. <laughs> you know, I'd do something. I'd just be doing something. Oh, you're not feeling good? How about now? Hey, yeah, you're welcome. You know, I just know me well enough. We'd all do that at least once or a hundred times, right? We'd all we'd do that. Right, that, so that's why I'm not all powerful. We see that he was all powerful. The uh, elements obeyed his word. In John 11, we see that he resurrected Lazarus. His power was given him, and we find uh, more of who he really is over in Revelation chapter number 1 and verse number 8. You don't have to turn there. You know the scripture well. He says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the all Mighty. Revelation 1, verse 8. So we understand who he is. The Almighty, we understand he has all power. So not only do we know that he is omniscient, meaning that he's, he knows everything. He's everywhere. He's omnipresent. Also, that he's all powerful. He's omnipotent. But we also know that he is the ruler over everything. Go with me to Revelation chapter number 19. Book of Revelation chapter 19 and verse number 16.
Miss Betty, I had to open another bottle of water. We're going to be here till this one's done too. Revelation 19, 16. The Bible says this. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He never began to exist and he will never cease to exist. He is the King of Kings and he is the Lord of Lords. John 1, 1 tells us that in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was was God. Now that's my King James. The NIV, NASB, some of them may read and was a God. Little g. Negative, my friend. That is the God. Amen. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. You look at that word there. It's a capital W. That's my God. That's my Savior. Amen. That's my Lord. In the beginning was the Word. So we see that He is ruler over everything because He's never ceased to exist and He'll never cease to exist, right? He was never uh, began to exist. He'll never cease. Hebrews 13, 8 tells us that He's unchanging. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. We understand that He is our Creator in Colossians 1, 16. Colossians 1, 16, He is our Creator. Bible says, For by Him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. So Colossians 1.16, we see he is our creator. By him and for him was it all created. In other words, everything that God is, so is Christ. Makes sense, right? He has all the attributes we just looked at. All the attributes of being omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent. We understand that. He's all-powerful. He's ruler of everything. We saw that in Revelation 19, 16, and saw that he had never ceased to exist. In John 1, 1, he's unchanging. Hebrews 13, 8, same yesterday, today, and forever, right? Hebrews 13, 8. Then our creator in Colossians 1, 16. So he is everything that God is. You know what one of his ministries is? What did I tell you that the candlestick stood for? Guidance. Go with me to John 8, 31. And I'm going to show you his ministry was guiding people. And still to this day, it's to guide people. It's for guidance. Just like that candlestick. John 8, verse number 31. When you find your place, say amen. amen. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. As the candlestick in the holy, or in, in the holy place guided the priest, as they went into the room, they, it lit up, so does the light of Christ, guide God's children in Truth. In truth. The light that he brought was to those living in darkness. What's a blind man? Can he see light? If you're blind, you can't see anything, right? You know how we can close our eyes, but we can tell if a flashlight or if light hits our eyes. We can tell that, right? A blind man can't. And what were you? Blind. Blind before salvation. Right? I just love the way everything comes together. He's the light to those living in darkness, blinded eyes, those darkness. John 3.19 tells us this. I tell you what, go ahead and turn over. I'm going to read a few scriptures, or a few, few verses here. We're almost finished up. John 3.19. And this is the condemnation, that light is coming to the world. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. In 2022, are we there? Have we been there for some time now? Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were, are evil or were evil, still are today. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, 
lest his deeds should be reproved. Huh. Sounds like what we preach, don't it, Brother Tom? But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. Without the light from the candlestick, there would have been no sight inside of the tabernacle. You would have saw nothing inside of there without that light given off by the candlestick, given the heavy tapestries and things of that nature on the tent. No light would make it through. This world that we live in is full of darkness, as has been since biblical times. Right here in Scripture shows us that it is full of darkness and is in need of full light of God's love and compassion. But it only comes through His power. See, we can't depend on ourselves. We can't depend on us. We have to depend on that. Those priests that walked in that room, they didn't depend on themselves for nothing. When I walk into this building and I flip on the light, I don't depend on myself to make sure it comes on. If it doesn't come on, I check the meter. If the meter's running, then I call Mike McFell and say, hey, get up here, something's wrong with the electricity. You wired this place, come get it. If I go out there and the meter's not running, I call Matt and say, hey, <laughs> have we paid the bill? Amen. That's not happened yet. I don't have to depend on man to do anything. I know that it's there. It's right, right? So why do I depend on myself? We've got to depend on Christ. Depend on the light. When, I walked in, when they walked into that holy place, that light was there. It was there. Now, if it wasn't on, did God fail? If the light wasn't shining in there, did God fail? Or did man fail? Somebody didn't trim it out. Somebody didn't fill that baby up with oil. Somebody dropped the ball. Hope Bible Baptist Church, if we're not shining the light, is it God's fault? Whose is it? Is it just pastor's fault? It's our fault. Right? It's our fault. We need to make sure that we are following the example in which Christ gave us. The light was brought to us that we're living in darkness, brought me out of darkness, lit my world up. What we live in is full of darkness. We can understand God's will through the light of Christ in 2 Corinthians 4, 6, for God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light and the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We've looked symbolically. We've looked functionally. We just looked spiritually. And last, we'll finish looking at it personally. We'll look at it personally. Go with me one more time. Matthew 5. You probably know where I'm going with this. Matthew 5, 14. This parlays right back into what we just talked about. That this world's in need of full light of God's love and compassion. It only comes through His power and only comes through people that are willing to trim their lights. Matthew 5.14, what does He tell us? Ye. Now, for those of you that may not understand King James English, ye means you. All right, just wanted to help. Didn't want nobody walk out of here and not understand the Scripture, right? Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men, that's a commandment from the Lord, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. Jesus is telling all of us here in this verse, personally, personally. Brother Peter, when he said, ye are the light of the world, he said, Peter Taylor, you're the light of the world. Mike Brown, you're the light of the world. Matt Flodovich, you're the light of the world. Reginald Mitchell, you're the light of the world. Jackson Redmond, you're the light of the world. That's what he said. If you're saved, you are the light of the world. Suzanne Taylor, you're the light of the world. Personally, let our light shine to this lost and dying world. Is it easy to let your light shine at Hope Bible Baptist Church? Sunday morning, it's easy to let your light shine. It Sunday evening, it's easy to let your light shine. Wednesday night, it's easy to let your light shine. You know why? 
Because there's other lights around you. If a light is set on a hilltop, can it be hid? Who would ever light a candle and hide it under a bushel? But rather you do what? You put it on a candlestick. Why? If I got a candle, it's dark in here, and I got a candle back here, what are you going to see? You're going to see me. That's it. You're just going to see what I got right here. If I do this right here with it, you'll see the first few rows. Can't be hid. Don't hide it. We got a light that's been given to us. Let God use our light personally. Let our light shine. Our testimony should be one that brings God glory. Our lives should be one that brings God glory, right? We should not be known by our faults. Anybody ever been there? I've been known by my faults. There are some that still know me by my faults. Unfortunately, that's been laid. I can't fix that. Then Brother Mike Brown was talking about that. You know, years have passed. They're gone. We can't fix that. You know, all we can fix is going forward. Instead of being known by our faults, we should be known by what gives God glory. Instead of being known by, oh, that's so-and-so that, that used to do this, that's so-and-so that they do that, this. You know, that's so-and-so. Goes to Hope Bible Baptist Church. Man, they're always telling somebody about Jesus. Their light is always shining to somebody within the community. We should always be known by what gives God glory, not what, unfortunately, looks bad on Him. There are people who will not go to church. I told you this earlier, but I'll say it again. There are people who, not, who will not go to church, Brother Reggie, because of the people that sit inside of a congregation. They won't do it. I've been told that. I'll never go to that church because of so-and-so. And that's sad. That's sad. I want to look at them and say, you do realize so-and-so goes to Walmart too. You better stay away from there. So-and-so goes to your favorite store too. You better stay away. So-and-so goes over to McDonald's too. Mm, you can't have that no more. Why is it that God's the only one who catches the back seat? Right? But you know what? It, it still falls on me. If somebody won't come because of me, it still falls on me. Right? They're wrong. They're wrong for not coming because God ain't done nothing wrong to them. God ain't done nothing in the world wrong to them. So they're still wrong in that, but maybe it's me. Maybe, maybe if there's somebody that would never step foot in that door over there, maybe I need to call them. Maybe I need to say, hey, look, friend, I'm sorry for the way I treated you. I'm sorry for the things I said. I'm sorry for it. X, Y, I don't know. I'm just telling you, I know for a fact that there are people who will not step foot into a church because of the people that go there. And that's sad. People would rather sit at home or sit in another church that they're dying spiritually than they would come to a place because of one person. I'm not changing that. But if it's because I've been something less desirable than what would bring God glory, then I need to fix that up. We play the religion game and we try to act all spiritual, but God has no more place in some people's hearts or lives to change them. Now, I've told you all about that friend of mine that I talked to their mother-in-law and told me, said, Bo, I'd really love to come to that church. But I never will. Because I can't sit on the same pew as that person and see them being a hypocrite. That woman, to my knowledge today, does not attend church anywhere. It will not. It's an excuse. They use it as an excuse, okay? It may not be real. It may not even be valid. But if I've done anything at all to give them an excuse, I want to get it right. But that person wouldn't. They just said, oh, well, as a matter of fact, he probably didn't even know. He didn't have enough spiritual discernment to know anything. But let's make sure that we don't just play the game. We don't just look good on Facebook. We don't just look good on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. We don't just put on our best and come in. But we let our light shine. That we be like that light that Christ there personally apply this stuff to our lives. Why should... We live what the Bible says. We'll finish right here. It's in 2 Corinthians 4 and verse number 3. 
I'll give you just a second to find it. I know I told you I was finishing up, so if you don't have your Bible open, that's fine. Just listen. Y'all know me by now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish at least five or six times before I actually close. <laughs> Miss Cat, that's still my average, right? Seven. Seven? Okay. Seven. I'm, I'm, I'm slipping today. <laughs> I say, here you go. Something's got to be right with me anyway. Second Corinthians chapter number four and verse number three. We'll finish right here, okay? But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. We preach not ourselves, but we allow the light of the glorious gospel to shine from us. How bright is our light shining? And if it's dimmed out a little bit, why? What needs to go so that that baby can be held up high and shine again? Here's bowed eyes closed this afternoon.